Genesis 45, and uh, I'll start in the ninth verse there. It says, Haste ye, and go up to my father, and say unto him, Thus saith thy son Joseph, God hath made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down unto me, tarry not, and thou shalt dwell in the land of Goshen. And thou shalt be near unto me, thou and thy children, and thy children's children, and thy flocks, and thy herds, and all that thou hast. And then if you drop down to chapter 47, verse 6, he says, The land of Egypt is before thee, in the best of the land. Make thy father and brethren to dwell in the land of Goshen. Let them dwell. And if thou knowest any men of activity among them, then make them rulers over my cattle. And then you go down to verse 27. And he says, And Israel dwelt in the land of Egypt in the country of Goshen, and they had possessions therein and grew and multiplied exceedingly. Uh, if you will, uh, bow your heads with me this morning. Lord, we thank You, God. We praise You for everything that You've done, God. We, we thank You, Lord, for the price, Lord, that You've paid for us, God. We thank You for each one, Lord, that's come out this morning, Lord. And we ask You, God, that You'd help us, Lord. Help each one of us, Lord, to be obedient, God. Help us to do what You'd have us to do, Lord. God, give us understanding this morning, Lord. Teach us by Your uh, Holy Spirit here this morning, God. Let us move closer to You, God. Uh, show us, Lord, what it is that You'd have us see. God, we ask, Lord, if there be a need this morning that You'd meet it. God, especially, Lord, if there's one that don't know You, God, we ask You, Lord, that You'd just convict them, Lord. Let them realize their condition, Lord, before it's everlasting too late. Lord, it's all these things we ask in Jesus' precious and holy name. And Amen. Now this is, uh, you guys bear with me here a minute. Uh, this is, uh, of course, Joseph, the, uh, uh, and, and this is the same Joseph that had the coat of many colors, and uh, he sold into slavery by his brothers down into Egypt here, that he ends up in Egypt. And, uh, Everybody knows about Joseph, I'm sure, but uh, he goes through a, a very difficult time. He, he winds up, uh, you know, being sold into slavery is bad enough, but then he ends up uh, in prison for so many years, and he has a, a horrible time, you know, as he as he waits on the will of God. But finally, uh, he interprets a dream, and and as time goes on, that that comes back to the Pharaoh. And I'm giving you the very short version, of course, but uh, Joseph ends up being second in command in all of Egypt here. He's he's directly under Pharaoh. You know, Pharaoh says that uh, Joseph's word is just as good as my word. And then uh, as years go by, finally... Uh, the famine is about to come on the land. You know, the Pharaoh has the dreams and Joseph interprets them and, and he tells him, you know, that you're going to have seven good years and then seven years of famine. And, and finally this famine, you know, years have gone by and finally this famine comes on that land. Uh, and Joseph is out here and he's, I guess he's kind of overseeing the, the disbursement of the food that they've collected up for the seven years, the seven good years. And he looks and, uh, and there's his brothers. He sees his brothers down here who are the ones who have sold him into slavery. Now, he don't hate his brothers or anything like that. We all, we all know he kind of uh, tries them a little bit, tests them a little bit and all that. Uh, but in the end of it, he sends those brothers back to bring his father back into Egypt because there's plenty of food. There's, you know, they've stored everything up uh, for the seven years. And, and he says, I want you to go down there and, and get your father. They don't know yet who he is, but I want you to go down there and get your father and all your brethren. And I want you to bring them uh, back into Egypt. Well, they bring them back into Egypt, and he tells them, and thou shalt dwell in the land of Goshen. Well, uh, this land of Goshen, as it tells on down here in chapter 47, uh, as, as Pharaoh spoke to Joseph, he says, in the best of the land, make thy father and thy brethren to dwell in the land of Goshen. Well, uh, they begin to dwell there. It's a wonderful place. It's the best of the land land of Egypt, uh, and all of Joseph's brother, Israel, now comes down here, Israel being the father of Joseph, uh, and I know the names get a little bit confusing, but if you uh, if you go back, you know, uh, Jacob becomes Israel, That's, he gets a name changed, he's, the, he's Israel, he's the father of Joseph and all these other brothers, and, uh, and now they begin to dwell in the land of Goshen. Alright, so is everybody with me so far? Have I, I hope I ain't lost you yet. 
I hope I don't lose you at all. But now they're they're pulled into a, a great place here. They've been in the land of Canaan, by the way. I want you to understand that before we get into this. Too. I get into it and I'll forget to tell you some of this stuff. But uh, they've come up from the land of Canaan uh, over into the land of Goshen. All right. Now Canaan was a wonderful place uh, when they had gotten to it. Abraham dwelled in Canaan, and uh, all the the great patriarchs there had been in Canaan. And now uh, Israel is down here in Canaan, and all of his sons are are living there. But now Canaan has become a place. Uh, there's there's no there's there's nothing to meet their needs anymore in Canaan. They, the the food is dried up, the crops have dried up, the the land is barren and all that. So now they have to move on to somewhere else. And uh, and Joseph being put in the position that he's in, he's able to bring them into uh, a great place. And he brings them down there uh, into Goshen, and and it says that uh, and and they had possessions therein and grew and multiplied exceedingly. Now all of us, like I said, you guys bear with me. This is I told David this morning, I said, this is kind of like one of those things you bite into and uh, the longer you chew it, the bigger it gets. That's the way this has been for me. Uh, the longer I've chewed it, the bigger it's got. But you guys pray for me and bear with me. Uh, now, they've left Canaan, they've come into Goshen, and it says that they grew and they multiplied exceedingly. Well, we've all left somewhere. You know, all of us who are born again here this morning, uh, we've we've left a place and we, you know, by, by miraculous uh, works, God has saved. He, he's brought us into uh, his his being one of his children. He's given us uh, an heir, you know. He's let us be heirs to the kingdom and all this. Uh, he's done great things. He's delivered us from uh, what we have been, and and, uh, and he's and he's given us a life, folks. He spoke life right down into our souls and and all that. We've talked about that a lot of different times, but you know, here we are as lost people, and we're walking around and we're we're looking for something to satisfy. But uh, little by little, those things begin to dry up and go away. You know, just like they were uh, down here in Canaan. And so now, uh, as God has spoken to us and He's paid a great price for us, uh, He brings us out of that place and He brings us to a place where there is life and there is refuge in His Son and there's uh, there's salvation there. And He's given us all this and we begin uh, now to have possession in that place and we begin uh, to multiply and we've you know we've we've had all these wonderful things. And how we we testify of our salvations, and and I do that myself, and that's a wonderful thing, folks. No better thing that can ever happen to you than to be born again. And uh, but we testify of that, and we tell everybody how wonderful it was. Well, for me, that's been ten or eleven years ago, you know. And I I think back to that, and how wonderful it was, and how great uh, that I felt uh, that day, and how that God uh, truly lifted the weight of the world off my shoulders there that day felt like, and all that. But but folks, I should be long past that by now. You know, that was a wonderful thing, but I should have uh, many things by now that, that uh, surpass even that. I should have many uh, possessions in the Lord now, and I should have a uh, great testimony. In ten years, I should be able to tell you many things that God has done for me. And I can, folks. I can tell you a lot of things. Uh, but I can tell you about hardships, and I can tell you about uh, times when it just didn't look like uh, that the ends would meet and in times when uh, we had sickness and times when we've had trials and, uh, and people have come against us and all kinds of uh, things but God one by one has brought us through every one of those it's been a long trip from there to here you see and a lot of things have happened along the way. You know, I've had to uh, pass a lot of things with the help of God. I don't, I don't take credit for anything, but with the help of God, we've been able to get past a lot of things, and uh, and we've been able to to reach new things. You know, and new blessings of God. And I was just kind of thinking about it as I as I studied for this, and you know, we've had milestones in our in our walk just since we've been here. You know, I I, I know that for a, over almost a year now, not not hardly a year, but for almost a year now, uh, we've talked about one particular night of the revival last year where a great blessing of God was poured out. And we probably had, I don't know how many, there's probably a hundred people here that night and probably uh, half of them at least uh, standing between the front seats and the altars and hands raised and uh, people praying and people crying and 
uh, people walking and all that kind of stuff. That was a, I felt like that we reached a milestone. Right? God gave us a great blessing that night, uh, but we've passed that now. We, we've left that behind us. Uh, and now, and, you know, and then we had a revival back in February and great things uh, happened in that. You know, wonderful things that we can still begin to testify, but we're, we're long since past that also. You know, we've moved on past that. Uh, and now, God's trying to bring us to a new place. He's trying to take us to a place that we've never been before. I know that we've multiplied. I know that we've gained possession. I know that we've done all these great things, but this is not God's plan for the rest of our life that we relish in what happened a year ago or a month ago or last week or yesterday. God's got something much greater in front of us. Much greater. As as time goes on now, I told you I got quite a few. I got a. It's a great story here, but if you come into the book of Exodus now, the very next book, in the first chapter there, Exodus one and eight, it says, "Now there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph, and he said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come on." Let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply. And it come to pass that when there falleth out any war, they join also under our enemies and fight against us. Uh, and so get them up out of the land. Therefore, they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens. And they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, Pithom and Ramses. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew, and they were grieved because of the children of Israel. And the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor, and they made their lives bitter with hard bondage in mortar and in brick and in all manner of service in the field. All their service wherein they made them serve was with rigor. Well, now they, you see, I want you to see what's happened. They've come from Canaan. They've been brought into Goshen. Goshen is a wonderful place. As I said, it's the, it's the best place in all of Egypt down here. They're, they're put down here in the very best place because Pharaoh has such a great love for Joseph. But now, as time has went on, uh, Pharaoh, he dies and a, and a new Pharaoh takes a new king uh, takes place and he begins to worry. And he says, oh, there's a lot of these Israelites and I'm afraid that they're going to overtake us. I'm afraid they'll join with an enemy and, and overtake us down here. So so now we need to do something about them. Now we need to begin to afflict them. We need to uh, make them slaves unto us. So now uh, this wonderful place that they've been for all these years uh, has now become a very horrible place. You know, see there? Now this great place where they've relished in all the blessings that God has given them now becomes a, a place of bondage, folks. Uh, I've said this different times, but I heard uh, Brian Gabbard say this one time. Uh, he said, it seems like the only ground that we ever gain as a Christian is what we've already lost before. You see, it seems like we struggle and we work and we pray and we read and we, we dig. We do everything that we do to do, know to do uh, to get to a certain place. Uh, and then little by little, we lose a little bit of that. We, we fall back from that. And then we, we work and we struggle and we strain and we do everything we know to do uh, just to get back to where we've been before. If that's all we ever are, we're just in a place of bondage. I found out that if you stay where you're at, if you're content to stay where you're at with God, very quickly you become religious. You say, well, I thought that's what this was about, being religious. <laughs> no, it's not. A religion is just a routine. It's just uh, your work can become a religion. Anything that's taught can become a religion. Man-made doctrine becomes religion. You know, that, that's why you see uh, every kind of church and every kind of doctrine and every kind of opinion and, and all this kind of, everybody at odds with each other and all, all that comes as a result of religion and it comes as a result of people reaching a point with God and saying, you know, I really like it here and I'm just going to stay put. I'm never going to move forward. I'm never going to ask God for more. I'm never going to pray more. I'm never going to read more. I'm never going to reconcile with that brother. I'm never going to do these things that God's commanded me to do because now I've reached the land of ghosts and I'm comfortable here. I love it here, but little by little that becomes a place of bondage. 
It, it becomes a place that you can't leave after you stay there for so long. You don't want to be there, folks. I'm going to tell you, God's plan this morning is for us to grow in Christ until the day that the breath leaves this body. We're supposed to grow as long as we're alive. Uh, we're supposed to grow in Him. We're supposed to gain something uh, in Christ every day as, until they lay us in a grave someday. We, we never reach that point of perfection, folks. Now, I know we're to strive for it. I know we're to reach for it. Uh, but we never reach that place. You, know, you look at the Apostle Paul, and as great a man as he was, uh, he, he gave that, uh, that account in Romans there where he said, uh, that that I would do, I don't do. And what I wouldn't do I do and what I would allow I don't you know all this uh, just a great speech and at the end of that he goes he, he says oh wretched man that I am but he professes in there he says I die daily I have to die after this this flesh has to die every day I have to press toward God every day I have to reach toward him every, I have to gain something every day in him it says that this Land of Goshen. Now, keep in mind where they're at right now. They're in the land of Goshen still. This is that wonderful place that they were brought to out of Canaan that it had been a wonderful place before, by the way. But now they're brought up into Goshen, a wonderful place. But now, as affliction comes and as they, they're still serving, they're still working, they serve with rigor, it says, but it says that uh, they made their lives bitter with hard bondage, folks. Uh, if we stay in that place, we're going to become that. We'll become bitter and we'll enter into a place of bondage. Uh, that religion is a bondage. That man-made doctrine is a bondage. Folks, you want to know uh, what God wants from you, then begin to read His Word and begin to uh, pray and beg Him to tell you. I know that, you know, I look around here and there's a lot of people here that's way ahead of me. I understand that. I know they are. And there's a lot of things that I want to know. I just go ask them. You know, what about what about this? What about this? But there's other things that uh, when I when God starts to deal with me on it, and I start to want to know what it is that I've got to do in certain things. I, there's just things that I can't ask them. There's things that I have to take up with God. There's things that He has to reveal to me. We count too much on what everybody else has has done and, and learned and all that, there's times you just have to do it on your own. There's times you just have to beg God for it yourself. So now as they become slaves to Egypt, you go to Exodus chapter 16. You guys don't have to turn everywhere I go, but in Exodus 16, he says, and they took their journey from Elam and the congregation of the children of Israel came up came unto the wilderness of sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the fifteenth day of the second month, after their departing out of the land of Egypt. This is Moses has now brought them up out of Egypt. And the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said unto them, Would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots, and when we did eat bread to the full. Uh, for ye have brought us forth into the wilderness to kill us, uh, this whole assembly with hunger. And then you go down into chapter 17. It says, And all the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin after their journeys according to the commandment of the Lord and pitched in Rephidim, and there was no water for the people to drink. Wherefore the people did chide with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said unto them, Why chide ye me with me? Wherefore do ye tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted for water, and the people murmured against Moses and said, Wherefore is this that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst. In one place, I, I just didn't put all the Scripture here because I didn't want to read you to death, but in one place they told Moses, they said, you brought us up out of a land of, of milk and honey, but you've not brought us to a land of milk and honey. They liked where they'd been. Oh, they hated it. 
Once, once the Egyptians began to afflict them, they hated it and they cried unto the Lord and they said, send somebody down here to deliver us. Uh, send somebody to bring us out of this place. And, and then uh, surely, just a little while later, God sends Moses down there. He says, I want you to go down there and deliver my people from Egypt. And so Moses reluctantly, of course, goes down there and he says, I'm going to bring you up out of Egypt. Well, they all think that's a pretty good idea. Uh, they, at, at least after God had sent plagues on Egypt and all this. Uh, they said, well, there must be something to this. We're going to go. Uh, so now they begin to follow Moses up out of this place uh, that they hated, folks. That's where they were beaten. That's where they were. Uh, their affliction was. That's where their... Uh, all their duties, I can't think of the right word, but all their uh, their duties were doubled as God began to afflict Egypt down here and all this. They hated that place, but now uh, when they're brought into the wilderness here, as they travel from the place that they're at to the place that's promised to them, they begin to hate that and wish they could go back to where they had been. Oh, if we could just go back to Egypt. <laughs> you know, ain't that the place you begged God to bring you out of? If we could just go back to Egypt. It says that's where we sat by the flesh pots and where we did eat bread to the full. We could eat down there. We could drink down there. We multiplied there. We done all this. If we could just go back to there. But now, now we're in the wilderness. I, trust me, folks. Uh, I got some understanding of where we're at, you know, and I know. Uh, sometimes, even myself now, I'm, I'm just talking to me right now, but uh, even myself, I get in this mindset, oh, uh, how wonderful it was a few months ago. Boy, I, I wish some of those people would come back. I wish they'd lead those fast songs. I wish they'd uh, preach those messages. I wish they'd do... Uh, folks, that's all behind us. We might be in a little stretch of wilderness, but God's got something a lot greater in front of us. We can't hate the wilderness. We've got to understand hey, it's a path to the next place that God's got for us. We have to get that in our minds. i got a little picture in my Bible case back there. I've showed it to two or three people. Uh, it's the wilderness of Judea. It's where Christ went after He was baptized by John. I always had a picture in my mind. You know, it's a, it's a, some type of jungle. It's a briar patch. It's a, I don't know what it is, but it ain't that, folks. Hey, it's just a dry, barren land. There's nothing there. I mean, you don't see a plant. Uh, you don't see a, a stream of water. You don't see anything but sand and rocks. It's sand and rocks. Hills and valleys. That's all that it is out there in that wilderness of Judea. But that's where Christ went after He was baptized and He come out of that and began His ministry. You see, maybe we've got a great ministry, but we've got to pass through that first, you see. But... David says God's wringing something out of you. You know, that's something that he says sometimes. And now, that's right, and it ain't pleasant, folks. I know, you know, I've uh, you wring water out of an old rag or something, and it don't look like a very pleasant experience. And it ain't when you're in that. But, folks, that's the tool that God uses to bring us to the next place. And, and there's only two things we can do, three things we can do. We can die in that wilderness. Let me not recommend that to you. We can go back to where we have been. That looks, it looked good while we was there, you know, but that ain't where we want to go. We don't want to go back to where we have been. Not if God's got something greater. You know, I think a lot of times people, people make it halfway through the wilderness or, or three quarters or, or maybe almost all the way through the wilderness, but they, they can't see the promise yet. Uh, and so they turn around and they go all the way back just as far as they've come, uh, all the way back into the place when, when the next step could bring them into the promise of God. <clears throat> Israel, they, they thought Canaan was wonderful. And it was while they were there. And then it just dried up on them, you know. And they thought Goshen was wonderful. And it was when they got there, you know. Uh, you, you think about it. Uh, as, as, as you reach things and you walk with Christ, you know, well, I got saved, praise God. Uh, nothing, you know, nothing as good has ever happened to us in our life. And then you, you begin this walk and you begin to feel the blessings of God. I remember, I remember 
just shortly after I got saved, and I, I probably everybody in the little church I was going to probably got tired of me pretty quick because every service I wanted to testify, and every service I'd stand up and I'd probably just say the same thing over and over again. I don't know, but I couldn't get three words out uh, for crying, folks. I just I I was just full of God, and I was full uh, of a zeal and, and no knowledge at all, just full of zeal and full of love for God. And, and I remember I, I pestered everybody in that church to death. Now, I wanted to do everything. Didn't know how to do anything. You know, well, let's start this and let's do that and let's uh, uh, let's you know push here and pull here and all that kind of stuff. And uh, and they're all looking at me like I got two heads. And uh, and I just wanted to do every, I just wanted to do something for God. And I remember we we started a we just called it a, a visiting program for lack of a better word. And. Uh, I, I guess God just led me into that. I said, let's do this and let's let's get into teams of, teams of two or three and uh, and two or three go this week, two or three go next week. I said, that way we don't kill everybody. No, we want to all go every week. Well, that lasted about a month. And it was down to we, me and one other man then. And we went for about a year every week knocking on doors and, and talking to people and trying to help them and praying for them. And, and all that, and then my the, the other man left me. <laughs> he went to another church, and so another man took his place. That is, some of you know him. That was Josh Madden. Took his place, and for a year, probably me and Josh went every week knocking on those doors. And finally, God, you know, oh, what great blessing it was! And, and finally, God moved us around a little bit. We wound up another church, and, and God really just dealt with our heart. Let's start to go to the jails, you know. So we started going to the jail in, in McKee up there and talking to those men uh, every week. And, and when we started that, what a great blessing it was. And, and we had a lot of promises. I know Jeremy can tell you this. We had uh, all kinds of promises made to us and all kinds of promises broken, but in that there were seeds planted. There was good done while we were there, but and it's a great thing. I'm not saying quit everything you're doing and go on to something else. But when God begins to lead you, don't look back to that and say, I have to stay there because that's where I've been for ten years. These great blessings begin to come, and then we begin to you know, we get in services and in, in prayer and all that kind of stuff, and we begin to feel the Lord, but then uh one day you get down on your knees and, and you begin to pray and you feel nothing. And you say, Lord, where are You? And you get down the next day and you pray and you feel nothing. And the next day and the next day. And who knows how long that goes. You know, a month of that just about kills me. <laughs> I heard Radford say when God leaves you like that for two or three years, I thought, oh Lord... Uh, I, <laughs> I dread getting to that place, you know. But that's where you got to go through to get to the next place, you see. He has to make something out of you while you're there. They, they, get, they get through this wilderness, and you go into the book of uh, Deuteronomy chapter 26, verse 5, and he says, And thou shalt speak and say before the Lord thy God, a Syrian ready to perish was my father, and he went down into Egypt and sojourned there with a few and became there a nation, great, mighty, and populous. And the Egyptians evil entreated us and afflicted us and laid upon us hard bondage. And when we cried unto the Lord God of our fathers, the Lord heard our voice and looked on our affliction and our labor and our oppression. And the Lord brought us forth out of Egypt with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm and with great terribleness and with signs and with wonders. And He hath brought us up into this place and hath given us this land and even a land that floweth with milk and honey. Well, now they've, they've come from Canaan. They've come into Goshen. They've, they've left Goshen. They've traveled across this wilderness for 40 years. And now they, they've... By the way, they come back to Canaan. That was the promised land where they left. But none, no living Israelite had ever been to Canaan. Understand that. I don't want you to think that God's just bringing the same ones back to the same place. But no, no living Israelite at that time had ever been in Canaan. They'd all been in bondage. All the, you know, Israel, Jacob had died. Joseph had died. All of his brothers had died. All them, none, none of them had ever been there. 
And you remember when we left it a while ago, it was dry and barren. There's nothing there. Well, now God's moved a whole other people in there and they've worked this land and now there's, there, there's giant grapes and there's milk and honey and there's, there's everything down here, down here in this land of Canaan. And now that they reach that place, you remember just a few minutes ago they was in the wilderness and they were looking back and, and they say, oh, I'd sure like to go back to, to Egypt. I'd sure like to sit around that flesh pot. And I'd sure like to uh, eat my fill of bread. And I'd sure like to have water to drink. And oh, oh, I wish I could go back to where it was better that we died there than die in this wilderness. How I would love to go back. But now in Deuteronomy, they've passed this wilderness. And He commands them there to speak. And He gives them a testimony. And He, he says, and we, when we cried unto the Lord God of our fathers, the Lord heard our voice and looked on our affliction and on our labor and our oppression. And the Lord brought us forth out of Egypt with a mighty hand and with outstretched arm and with great terribleness and with signs and wonders. And He hath brought us into this place and hath given us this land, even a land that floweth with milk and honey. How many of them do you think would have been willing to went back to Egypt now? Now that He's got them into this promised land, how many of them do you think would have went back to Egypt now. How, how often do you think you would have heard him say, if we could just get back to Egypt? Never. They would have never said that. Why? Because they're, they're past the wilderness and they're in the, the promised land. They've reached the place that God has for them. And they're in this land. They, they, they told him at one point, you brought us out of a land that flowed with milk and honey, and you've not brought us into a land that flowed with milk and honey. But now, he says, and hath given us this land, even a land that floweth with milk and honey. I, I imagine now, they're up here in the, their promised land, and they're saying, man, this milk's a lot better than the milk that flowed down there in Egypt. And this honey's a lot sweeter than what was in Egypt. And I don't want to go back there ever again, you see. <laughs> you just have to reach that next point. And then, I guess all this has been good news so far, maybe, but. And then you get into Deuteronomy 31 20, and he says, For when I shall have brought them into the land which I swear unto their fathers that floweth with milk and honey, and they shall have eaten and filled themselves and waxed and fat. Then will they turn unto other gods and serve them and provoke me and break my covenant. Now God's brought them into this land flowing with milk and honey. He's given them great blessing. He's given them everything that they need. And He says, now, now that, they, now that they're comfortable again, now that they've got everything they need again, they'll turn to other gods. And you wonder, we wonder why we have to go through these things. We wonder why we have to walk through this dry place. We wonder why we have to get into this wilderness. Why we have to suffer the affliction between blessing and blessing. I'll be honest with you. I speak for myself. It's because I can't be trusted in that place of blessing for too long. You see, I get in that, oh, I get comfortable, and before long I get lazy. I'll just be honest. That's just how it works. That's the flesh. You know, that's just the flesh. I get into that place, oh man, God's just done everything for me. My bills are paid. Uh, good food on the table. All this kind of stuff. Nothing to worry about. I think I'll just sit back a while. And then that affliction begins to come. And guess where I find myself then? On them knees again. Oh God, I need you after all. You know? <laughs> Lord, my name wasn't worth as much as I thought it was. It's, it is Your name, Lord. I understand now. And He says, okay, I'll begin to bless again. He begins to bless, and before long, uh, you know, the old flesh wants to get puffed up a little bit again. Well, boy, I'm doing good again. Look how good I... Oh, no. He just pulls that old rug out from under you again. He says, no, it's not Your name, it's mine. Your name on that sign up there, <laughs> it ain't worth a dime. It's my name. It's His name, folks. That's what's going to matter. i got one more Scripture here, and I'm going to hush. <clears throat> in the New Testament, in 1 Corinthians 9.24, Paul spoke, and he says, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not 
as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it under subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Well, Paul begins to relate this to a race. And he says that they all run. Everybody, everybody that enters that race runs. But only one wins. You know, we understand that. But he tells us, he says, so run that you may obtain. And I, I was thinking about a race. And you take a, a race, if it's very long, like this, like this Boston Marathon up here where these people got blowed up the other day. What's, how long is a marathon? 26, 26.4 miles. It's a long way. And they can't run that race from beginning to end without provision. They stop every so often and, and somebody hands them a, a bottle of water or a Gatorade or something. They give them something that, to help them keep going. And I imagine that, you know, I, I don't know what they call them, maybe a checkpoint or something like that, but I imagine... That it is, okay, they've passed checkpoint number one. They've got that drink of water or whatever it was that they give them there. And now they're running for checkpoint number two. The finish line ain't so much on their mind as checkpoint number two is. And so now they're running for checkpoint number two. And the farther they go, the closer they get to it. But the closer they get to it, the thirstier they get. And the more wore down they become and all that. And no doubt, they probably think, man, how good it was back here at checkpoint number one. They gave me water. They gave me Gatorade back there. They, they let me rest. I guess I'll just turn around and go back. You know, that's not what they do. They, they just press on to checkpoint number two. And by passing those checkpoints, as time goes on, and by check, passing those checkpoints with no provision in between and no great feeling in between, eventually they, they look down the road and they see something that they've not seen yet in that race, and that's the finish line. Shouldn't we be striving? Should the, the wilderness bother us as, as much as it does? I mean, I'll, I'll confess, I, I get down, I get the pooch mouth every now and then, you know, stuff like that. But I'm a pretty good hand to pep talk myself. It usually don't last long. I, I, I remind myself, I'm redeemed. He's, he's paid a great price for me. I was lost and now I'm saved. I had nothing and now God's given me everything. What have I really got to be down about? Shouldn't we strive for the next... Next stop on God's journey for us. So should we strive for the finish line? There's going to be bad places in between. I, I guarantee you that. I promise you that. You live very long, you'll go through another one. <laughs> if you ain't in, in one right now, you'll go through another one. Shouldn't we just press on to the, the next place that God has for us? So, so as they get us a song, you think about... You know, I preached a message down here. It's been several months back. I titled it "Move On, Abraham." Move on, Abraham. You look at the you look at Abraham, and uh, he was born in a certain place, and he moved, and he moved, and he moved, and every one of those places had a, a spiritual significance. God never allowed him to go back, and God never sent him back to where he began or anything like that. God kept him moving every step of the way, and no doubt. Uh, he passed some horrible places. No doubt, he walked through some horrible places. But eventually, he came to the place that God had promised him. And you think about, think about old Abraham there for a minute. You think about, you know, God's given him, his greatest promise wasn't a land, it was a son. And so God gives him a son. And then one day, God says, kill that boy. You imagine what a place he must have got to, you know, how discouraged we get and all that. God's never had me lay one of my boys on an altar and uh, to kill him. But as he, as he went to that place, he had to pass that. He had to pass that before he could go on to the next place. So as we stand this morning, I, I beg you, come and pray this morning. This altar is open. Pray as long as you need to pray. If you need help, please, please let one of us know. We'll pray with you. They called him Jesus. He came to love. Hey, come.
Come and pray this morning. This altar is open. This may be the next step. This may be the end of that wilderness this morning. But what you find on this altar may be the next step with God. It may be a checkpoint, folks. That may be the checkpoint for you. Maybe the place where God meets this current need and brings you to the next place. Mind the Lord this morning. Just mind the Lord. Those children of Israel, they wanted to go back so bad. They said, if I could just go back to Egypt. But God said, don't go back to Egypt. Go on to this land that I promised you. Mind me this morning. Do Go where I've sent you. Because I know Maybe you've not reached Canaan yet at the beginning of their journey here. Maybe you've not uh, had salvation. Folks, listen, no greater thing will ever happen to you in your life. No more wonderful thing will ever happen than to feel God take up an abode in your life. That's the beginning of your journey. But if you don't take that beginning, you'll, you'll never reach the promises of God. and died lost with that very plan, folks. My name is one. If he's been, you just come. That's all there is. Just step out. I heard a man testify one time. He said that he sat in the church house lost and said, God just dealing with him. And he said, finally, he said, uh, I worked up the courage to step out. And he said, I raised my left foot up. And he said, when my left foot hit the floor again, I was a new creature. Folks, there, there's no great, long, drawn-out prayer that has to be said. Hey, it's just, forgive me, Lord, a sinner. Hey, if He's dealing with you, He's ready to save you. It's just, forgive me, Lord, a sinner. Hey, it's just, cry out on Him. Ask Him, God, please. Please save me, Lord. God, I know I need a Savior. Please save me. Amen. Amen. Keep right on praying, folks. Pray right on. Pray right on. If there wasn't a true Lord, I just couldn't go on. I couldn't face the call or sing your song. There'd be no reason for the sun to bear. Maybe you're just in a place you don't understand why God's got you where you're at. He's got a plan, folks. Trust Him this morning. Trust Him this morning. Oh, 